Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our weekly Wednesday sessions at Sendable. I'm an in-house marketer here. Um, and if you don't know it already, Sendable is a social media management platform designed for agency owners and marketers to manage multiple brands and social media. And yeah, it's so great to have you today because we have a very special um, session for agencies. And really, can't wait to get started. Um, so just very quickly, I want to introduce you to Chris. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about how to get new business as an agency without ads and the cold calls. Uh, Chris is a business um, coach for agency owners, and he's helped empower agency owners all around the world to lead successful lives and run successful businesses. Say hi, Chris. Hey, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Cool. All right. And just very quickly before we get started, it's going to be a value packed uh, presentation from Chris and we're going to go very, very fast, uh, but we will provide a recording for this session. Also, there's going to be a very special offer for key and agency owners. So keep your ears open and a free downloadable uh, template for prospecting as well. We'll be sharing all of these links during the session and also in the email afterwards. And of course, at the end, we're going to have a 15 minute Q&A. And if you have any questions for Chris at all about running your agency or getting new business, please use the questions uh, tab and we will get back to you at the end. So I think that's it. Uh, we can dive in, Chris. Sounds great. Sweet. And while we make the change, I have a little poll for everyone in attendance today. Uh, it's just to better understand um, where, who, what statement best describes you. Uh, I'm going to publish that poll right now and it should be live. So just next to the questions tab and the chat tabs, you have the polls tab. So if you can quickly vote which statement best describes you, that would be great. All right. All yours, Chris. All right. It is. I'm so excited. Thank you, Veronica and the Sendable team. I am just so excited to present something that I think will be very valu valuable for you and your agency, especially during these times. So we're gonna talk about how, get, how to get new business as an agency without ads or cold calls. So uh, quickly before we dive in, I just wanna share a little bit about myself. Like Veronica said, I am a business coach and I specialize in working with agency owners. And here's uh, me with a few of uh, my great clients I'm really fortunate to work with. So this is us at Social Media Marketing World probably the last in-person conference that I can think of uh, before all, all the pandemic went down. Um, but I'm, I'm just really blessed to be able to work uh, with amazing people there. I coach, I speak, and I surf, and even occasionally at, at conferences in selfie mode. All right, so with the, you know, the global pandemic and just all the negative uh, consequences that means for individuals and businesses, you know, it's just really easy to get discouraged and to get down. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I've been on the phone with agency owners nonstop in the last month. And I just want to share some things that I've learned as we've been navigating these situations that I think will be valuable for you. So I think bottom line, we're in a period of uncertainty and disruption. Uh, so that a lot of times that brings up negative feelings right away. But I want to encourage you uh, to look for opportunities that are that are before you that might not have been there even two months ago so yeah there are opportunities now that i'm not going to say this is easy for the faint of heart but there are things that you'll uh you'll be able to see after today that i think really benefit uh you and your agency so today's agenda we're going to share i'm going to share five reasons why the next few quarters may work out well for you if you're a small or medium-sized agency four keys to position your agency to win uh, during these times, five ingredients to an offer that converts, and then eight steps to fill your agency sales pipeline without paid ads or cold calls. Obviously ads are expensive, and I don't think there's anything positive to say about cold calls, so <laughs> we wanna avoid those if, if possible. So there's five reasons why the next few quarters may work out well for you if you're a small or medium-sized agency, and these are, are things that I think we, you should really pay attention to. So the first reason is the big corporate shift going on. So over the last you know two or three years, there's been a big move from uh, at the corporate level, kind of a trend where people are going from agencies bringing their marketing in-house. So 
that was obviously not good news for agencies then, but there is a shift going on where people are going from in-house teams back to agencies. So that's a really good thing if you are an agency. So there's two ma major reasons for that. Uh, one is cost savings. It's just, it's more cost effective to hire an agency than to have a whole team of, of employees that you're paying benefits. But also there's a pay perform for uh, performance aspect that you wanna be aware of. So in uncertain times where, uh, you know, maybe revenue might be shaky for some of these businesses, they need, they need performance for the money that they're investing in their marketing. And it's just really difficult if you have a team who's underperforming or an individual who's underperforming, it's difficult to make quick changes, but you can do that with an agency. So there's a big shift from in-house to agencies. The second reason is there's so much great talent available. There's a huge opportunity for you to upgrade your team just with all the corporate and agency downsizing that's going on. So there's uh, really talented people that are gonna be available that maybe weren't before. And then even the existing people who that weren't downsized, if there's downsizing going on around them, they're experiencing higher workloads and stress. So your opportunity might be more appealing to them uh, just than where they are today. And third, uh, large agencies can't keep up. This isn't anything new, but marketing strategies and platforms are changing so quickly. And this is just being amplified as agencies, you know, may have to cut staff, uh, what changes that are going on. And that's just, uh, you know, their deficiency becomes even more apparent. Another reason is e-commerce is accelerating. And I think that's what makes this uh, period of disruption a little bit different than some of the recent ones like 9-11 or the 08 uh, market crash. We live in a world now where it's it's really an online, uh, you know, online first customer. Like we prefer actually to buy online in a lot of different verticals. And obviously, you know, over the last several years, Amazon has uh, grown really, really big and retail has shrunk. And just things like the coronavirus are only accelerating that that trend. And then finally, the, the fifth reason is the pretenders will leave. So in any booming economy, and if you think of a, a really hot uh, field like digital marketing, you get a lot of unqualified pretenders who enter the market. You know, they throw, you know, some type of, of uh, title up on LinkedIn as far as like Facebook marketing expert or podcasting expert and they enter the market. So this just leads to increased competition and confusion uh, for both your clients and your prospects. So, you know, unless they really know the digital game, they might not know the difference uh, between you and somebody who's a pretender. So the good news, if you are a legit and you, and you uh, provide a great service, this disruption actually weeds out pretenders. And this isn't unique to just digital marketing. You see this a lot, uh, realtors, uh, you know, during boom times, uh, all these uh, people come out of, out of nowhere into the market. And then uh, when there's disruption, they leave. So this is actually really good news for, for legit uh, agencies. So there are four keys to position your agency to win during these times. Key number one is to turn off news and social noise. So if you go on social and news, chances are there's a lot of negativity and fear popping up. Um, that can lead you to be distracted and overwhelmed. And when you're distracted and overwhelmed, you tend to miss opportunities. So kind of negative input equals negative output. So we wanna just kill the negative input to, to stay as positive as possible. Key number two is to build up your cash reserves. You know, in disruption, nobody has a crystal ball. You can't predict when great opportunities will pop up. So you wanna have plenty of cash on hand to weather the storm. And this probably would go both personally and on a, on a business level. So a little pro tip, uh, have at least three to six months of expenses in liquid cash if you can. Uh, that's actually a recommendation by Dave Ramsey, kind of the acclaimed financial coach. If you have more of that, that actually, it, you know, really puts you at peace and you can even take more risks to, to have a, a greater reward. The, the third key is to show them the money. So you must show your clients and prospects the ROI of your services. This is a must. You wanna be an essential business for them, you need to do this. So your reporting must be clear and easy to read. I know of uh, some agencies that they are getting an ROI for their client, but their client can't understand or pick that out. So their perception is their reality. So you wanna make it easy to understand. And you just wanna put yourself into your clients and your prospects shoes. 
you know, in uncertain times, or they might even be in dire times for their business, they want to make a safe bet. So they want to, you know, they want to make an investment where they can put a quarter into marketing and get two quarters out. That's what they're looking for. Now, I know as marketers, it's not as easy, like, you know, is that, and there isn't necessarily a guarantee, but if you have a solid system where you can show an ROI, you're going to be an essential business, even in times of disruption and uncertainty, but really anytime. And the fourth key is to choose your inner circle wisely. You know, with a lot of negativity and fear in the news and social, maybe even from family, friends, and neighbors, you need positive people who are going to care about your well-being. And uh, just a, a pro tip here, uh, it might be a great time to join a mastermind group of like-minded people or hire a coach or have both. You want to have, you know, positive people in your ear uh, helping direct you during these times. So of the four keys that I shared, I want to hear from you. Which one do you need the most? Uh, number one, to turn off news and social. Uh, two, build up cash. Three, show them the money. Or four, choose your inner circle. I want you to type uh, which, which key you need in the uh, chat box. All right, I'm seeing a lot of threes of showing the money. Some building up cash. So quite a variety here. All right, to build uh, sales and revenue during these times, I can't think of a, a better way to do that than a, a method I call the Costco method. So this is not, uh, for those of you that might be in the, in the US, this isn't Costco where you go to shop, this is the Costco method. I'm gonna break it down. So first you wanna connect with the right prospects, offer an outcome that they need, sign the deal, collect the money and onboard the new client. So that's kind of the simple progression. Uh, with our limited time today, we're, we're going to focus in on the connect and offer piece. I'm, I figure you can probably uh, handle the sign, collect, and onboard uh, portion really well. We're going to focus in on the connect and offer. So there are five ingredients to an offer that converts. So first, you want to lead with your best ROI service. So you must get an ROI in the first 30 to 90 days in environments like this. So you, the businesses that you approach, they might need more of a life raft now than the yacht. So they need something that's gonna get them through uh, to the other side. And they may not be looking for, you know, your, your biggest premium package that, you know, spans the next two years. You wanna look at the, the life raft now. So even, uh, even if, let's say you offer something that's a little bit more long game, like uh, SEO or social media or content, you want to lead with, with something like email marketing, paid ads, chatbots, group management, something that will turn a significant ROI in 30 to 90 days. It doesn't have to be these, but those are ones that I've just, in working with clients, uh, they work really, really well. Now, if one of those things aren't in your wheelhouse as an agency, uh, if needed, team up or hire someone that will, that can get you in the door getting a, a quick win for your clients, and then, then you can upgrade them and they can be a long-term uh, loyal client. So the second ingredient is to simplify to multiply. I can't think of a better business example than Apple about really uh, simplifying uh, aggressively. So you wanna narrow your niche, uh, narrow your service menu, and narrow what I call your process stack. So this is just an example, um, you have to find out what that means for you. But for example, instead of serving everybody, we're gonna help B2C companies grow their sales. And your services menu, you could break it down into a, you know, one package like the social sales acceleration package. And you're gonna deliver uh, with a stack of Facebook ads, organic social with great tools like Sendable uh, that send traffic to a Shopify site and you're gonna use a Klaviyo uh, backend email system. So instead of uh, trying to master five traffic sources or three different types of e-commerce websites or four email providers, I recommend what are, the, what are those essential tools and that essential processes to get your result? Outcome-based packaging, this is big. So you wanna name and describe uh, what you're doing, and it must scream the outcome the business wants and needs. So I think this is, I actually had a mem men uh, mentor that said this is, remember, businesses aren't buying your service, they're buying what your service will do for them. So 
we get excited about our processes and the things that we're doing, but ultimately it's about what what they what it will do for them. And then you need to maximize your client's ROI. You know, if you're going to lead with this, you need just need to figure this out at all costs, but not at the expense of your integrity. You don't want to do anything that is, uh, you know, not integral or um, deceptive in any way. But you got to figure out whether that's uh, learning, being a part of uh, peer groups, uh, you need to figure it out. And then finally, you need to share case studies. So you get ROI results and then you want to share them. So these could be individual clients or it could be data across multiple clients. And I recommend uh, sharing those in prospect intros and pitches on your website and in social. So kind of a funny story. So I have uh, several clients that uh, started getting all these leads from brands on Twitter of all places. And I, you know, I hadn't, honestly, I hadn't logged into Twitter in like a year um, just because I thought it was, you know, a platform that was going to be phased out, but they were just sh sharing screen shares of some of the results that they were getting and some of the, the problems that they were solving, you know, on a simple platform like Twitter. And now I have clients that their biggest kind of pain point or problem right now is they don't have time to respond to all the brands that they're getting inquiries from. And it's like stressing them out. So we're like developing systems on how to deal with that. So you, you don't necessarily have to share it on Twitter. There isn't any uh, magic within that, but where your audience of prospects and clients are, that's where you wanna share it. And here's a, just a quick example. I have a, a client who runs an SEO and ads agency, and he actually turned his case study into a blog post. And uh, with a, that heading, that gets uh, you know business owners, especially in this environment, gets their attention right away. He's actually used this in uh, the subject line when he was uh, even promoting a webinar. So these are very uh, valuable assets that you need to share everywhere. So if you're uh, thinking about you know this, these uh, tips with your offer are really good, but you want some individual help, or you just want help navigating uh, how to grow in this season, uh, I'm going to offer ten. Uh, agency growth coaching sessions uh, free of charge for anyone who is on the uh, the uh, webinar today. So in this 45 minute session together, we'll create a clear growth plan for your agency and really fine tune your offer and really customize it to, to what you offer. Uncover any hidden challenges that may be sabotaging the growth of your agency and maybe that's causing you to work uh, way too many hours if you're working around the clock. And then you'll leave renewed, re-energized with a clear next step to grow your agency the smart way. So I'll offer uh, to the first 10 who schedule, uh, I'll offer that. And you just go to schedulewithchris.com and we'll get you plugged in and get you some help. All right, so we did the offer piece. Now I wanna move to the connect piece. So we know what we're gonna share with them. Now, how do we connect? So there are gonna be four targets to connect with your current clients, your past clients, your current prospects, and new prospects. And we're gonna do that in a system I call eight steps to fill your agency's sales pipeline. And this has been really effective for the clients that I work with. So here are the eight steps. Eliminate, upgrade, ask, re-engage, offer, activate, recruit, and tag team. So we're gonna break down each one of these individually and you're actually, after this uh, presentation, you're gonna get an email that has a link sharing this exact uh, Google Sheet that I use to prompt you in each of these eight steps. And it's a place where you can brainstorm and track all of your outreach to keep it organized all in one place. So each one of these steps will correlate to a tab within this, uh, this document. So the first step is to eliminate pauses or cancellation. So retention is way easier than new sales. Uh, and it doesn't really do you any good if you pick up three new sales this month, but you lose four, four clients. So our goal in this is to pause the pauses and cancellations and win back their business. So you gotta remember your clients are looking for strong leadership during this uncertain, and it could be a, a, a time that's really stressful for them. So here's uh, three steps to pause a pause or cancellation if you get one of those kind of inquiries. So likely you'll get, uh, maybe it's a text, email, or a voicemail saying that your client wants to pause or cancel. The first thing you wanna do is you wanna acknowledge that they are, that they are, you know, that you received their request. You don't wanna pretend that it, it didn't exist. 
And then you want to really empathize and just say, hey, I'm so sorry that X, Y, and Z happened to you. And then you want to address the two conversations that are going on. One is between you and that client, but probably the most important question is how is that client's business going to get back on track? And that's the one you want to address first. So offer to help them first before talking about the pause or cancellation. So that might uh, look like, hey, can we jump on a call or Zoom later today or tomorrow? And that's uh, take a look at your situation and that's that's create a plan to get you uh, through these times and even better on the other end. So this is your time to really help them and get them through. Now, it's probably unrealistic to think that you're gonna save every single client who wants to pause or cancel. But if you do, and you're there for them and you help them in some of their, you know, the most difficult times, they are going to be a loyal client for a lot of times. And they're always going to remember, even when uh, they have challenges come up in the future, they're going to think of you and they're like, that person at that agency is the person that I can trust to get me through this. And you probably have a, a client for life and they're probably going to be a great referral source for you. So this is your opportunity to, to shine and really help them. So what you'll do is uh, you'll just think about uh, your current clients who are requesting a pause or cancellation or who might be on the urge of, of pausing or canceling. You, you just type them into this list and then this will help you track as you reach out to them. All right, step number two is to upgrade your revenue per client. So I want you to think about your happy current clients that you have. What could they upgrade to? You know, if they're at a $2,000 retainer, what, what can you offer them that could could double that. And uh, if, if nothing really comes to mind or you don't have anything in place, uh, I recommend using the three levels of upgrades. Think about how can you improve their results? How can you improve the speed of their results? Or how could you revolutionize their experience? And, and really brainstorm and see what comes to mind uh, as far as what they can upgrade to. Step three is to ask for referrals from your current clients. So think about your happy current clients. Which ones could send you a good referral if you ask them? I think a lot of agency owners that I know hesitate this because it's just, you're kind of putting yourself out there, but uh, you need to ask. And I think a lot of clients would love to help you out, in, but really be specific in what you're asking for. So these first three steps, they had nothing to do with uh, outside, you know, new prospects or cold calls or anything like this. This is actually working your warm network of current clients. And then uh, step number four is to re-engage your past clients. So think about your past clients who you still have a good relationship with. What new or different offer could you present to them? So think about, you know, I talked about the life raft offer, kind of that, you know, something that you can get an ROI in the next 30 to 90 days. Think about that. Um, it's so much more effective when you reach out with something a little different or a new opportunity for them than just saying, hey, I'm just checking in, uh, do you wanna buy? Like that just, you can only say that so many times and it's not really that appealing. Um, maybe you can share a little, a little nugget about a case study and share your life raft offer. Especially a, a pro tip, think about if, if a, a, a company left you to go in house, this is a great time to reach out to them. Step five is to offer your prospects. So think about your current prospects in your pipeline right now. What new or different offer could you present to them? Step six, activate your connectors. So think about the connectors who are big fans of your business. You know, which one of those could send you some good introductions if you ask them? So I bet a lot of your connectors, you know, they're, they're stuck at home. They're probably on LinkedIn most of the day or they're doing Zoom calls or phone calls just to catch up and check in with people. Why not activate them with with uh, you know with with your offer and what in what you're needing to to get connected with? And I bet they'd be thrilled to, to make uh, introductions, especially if you can help that business, you make them look good. All right, step seven is to recruit your referral partner. So who do you know has abundance of leads that would be thrilled to send you some? So think about industry leaders that you may know uh, or people, they might even be competitors that do, you know, they specialize in a little slightly different uh, niche. Uh, that Those are great people uh, to ask. And, you know, they actually a story about this. 
I had a client years ago, we went through this activity and she provided, her agency provided Facebook uh, marketing and one of her friends was Mari Smith. So she, she, she reached out, she was kind of scared at first and uh, she reached out to Mari and Mari was, was thrilled to send her some leads. Mari actually put her on her website as a preferred vendor and the leads just kept flowing in. So this can be really, really powerful. And step number eight is to tag team. So who do you know has the clients already who could bring you in on their accounts as a contributor or contractor? This is huge. I actually have, I have a client who uh, really does this really, really well. Uh, he's someone who's, his double his business three years in a row and he'll probably approach like the 200,000 uh, US per year. Mark, he doesn't even have a website yet just because he does this, this step really, really well. So. You know who could who could bring you in on their accounts as a contributor or contractor so those are the eight steps um, as far as your action steps uh, moving forward uh, to fine-tune your offer make it our you know really focused on ROI and an ROI that you can get in the next 30 to 90 days then you want to fill your sales pipeline using those eight steps so you really load up those lists and then you can start connecting with others and sharing uh, the great offer that you put together all right, I know I covered a lot today in a short period of time. So from everything that we covered today, what was the most valuable thing for you? I'd like to hear from a few of you. So if you'd type this in the chat box, of everything we covered, what was the most valuable thing for you? Let's see, uh, refining the niche offering, definitely. The life raft offer. Yeah, you really need to adjust your approach just because what your prospects and clients are thinking right now is differently. Packaging. Yeah, client retention is easier than acquisition. Awesome. These are all great. It's really awesome to hear, guys and ladies, to tell us in the chat window. That was great, Chris. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, glad to. All right. Well, we wait for a few more. Did you have anything else, Chris, or should we? Jump into the Q&A? Let's jump into Q&A. I want to help help some folks out here. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're going to jump into the Q&A now. Uh, while we do, please do add your questions for uh, Chris in the questions tab, and he, we'll try and get through all of them. So please do uh, do that. There's also going to be a poll just to see how useful you found the session, but it sounds like you did find it quite useful. So I'll run that in a second for you. And I guess we can switch slides again. <laughs> Let's see if that happens smooth. Lee? All right. Okay, there we go. All right. So just a quick reminder, do sign up for the complimentary session that Chris is offering for your agency growth coaching. Uh, he is giving this amazing offer for just our attendees today. So first 10 who sign up will get it for free. And then also please feel free to connect with him via email and Twitter. Uh, and yeah, so I guess that's my cue to start the Q&A. Uh, Chris, can we start with a few questions from our community before we jump into the questions? So, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, cool. So, one of the questions we received was, should I adjust the way I frame my social media proposal and or pitch deck at this point in time? Yeah, definitely. I think you need to revise. You want to get inside your prospect's head and, you know, they have maybe have different concerns right now than they did before. So, I would really uh if you if you are able to uh, you know, you have some contact and you, you're able to ask some questions ahead of time, really pay attention to the things they really need and want right now and use their, even their own language in those, in those, uh, pitch decks. And you want to get bottom line with it. You know, what's the ROI of, of hiring you? Yeah, that does really feed into that life raft offer. I think whatever, 
will bring results right now. Thanks so much for answering that, Chris. Um, the other question we have, my prospect uh, and or client is asking for a COVID-19 discount. What should I do? Yeah, I I don't like to, <laughs> to give discounts and I don't advise my clients to do that. If you absolutely have to, to save it, um, I would think about what other value adds that might they be able to give you um, that would help you down the line. So could you get permission to share your results uh, with, you know, of their brand w as a case study, um, you know, plugging in video testimonials, written testimonials, reviews, think of those assets that would be great sales pieces and closing pieces down the line. Uh, that I think that's a, that's something that you could ask that, um, you know, if they're willing to, if they want a discount, um, you, they, you want them to provide some value for you. But I, I'm, I'm like, how can, how can you make it, you know, a, a win for, win for them? I would, I would try to avoid discounts if you can. Gotcha. Um, we did actually have a specification on this question and whether discounts should be included in invoices. What do you think if you do give a discount? Oh yeah, yeah. You wanna you wanna show that, and uh, I would almost phrase like if you could if you could even I, I don't like the word discounts. Maybe uh, switch it to incentive mm. based on that. But I would I would include that um, in in the the invoice. Now there's other ways that you might be able to approach that. Maybe you can work on a, on a payment plan or like delayed payment for thirty days. Or uh, here's another great one. If you do something that's very very ROI based, like paid ads. Uh, could you do a smaller retainer, but a percentage of revenue or, or your return on ad spend? That's a way that maybe cuts the risk for them now, but also could benefit you later as long as you get the results. Oh, those are great suggestions. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then finally, a uh, question from our community, and then we jump into your questions, fellows. Um, is there a good way to show my potential clients that I want to serve them and not sell to them during this time? Yeah, I think you want to you want to treat uh, you know if even if it's a sales meeting, you want to think about how can we put a plan together to benefit them and really think strategically. It's more like a strategy session than a call. I think that's the way you want to approach it, and you're just going to uncover you know a little framework that I use is we talk about the results that they want, you know the reality of where they are now, and then what are the roadblocks that are between reality to results. That's just a little framework that might be helpful. Come up with a plan uh, to overcome those those obstacles and get them results. And I, I think that's that's a more collaborative way to approach it uh, than just trying to sell things. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, we have a bunch of questions, Chris. So I hope you're ready. Yeah, uh, so the most upvoted one right now is from Nico. Thank you for asking. Do you have any strategies to reactivate customers that have paused their account during the crisis? Yeah. So the to reactivate customers uh, when they've already paused during the crisis, I think um, I think they actually the deferred payment. Uh, could be a really great option for them or uh, a revenue share. I actually have seen a, uh, a website company, uh, you know, they have like deferred payment 60 days, like you don't even have to, to pay for it. Um, or, you know, if they can't afford, you know, your retainer, uh, could you do a small amount? You want them at least invested, but a percentage of revenue. I think that that might be a way uh, to do that. I think when you check in with with customers that are maybe not active, um, I think you want to really li you you want to ask questions about you know what are their current challenge you know what are they challenged with right now, and really ask them like what would make this a win uh, to work with us or what do you need uh, you know to make this make this work. Nice, thank you, Chris. The next question is from Cecilia. How do you build a rapport, rapport? Sorry, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. How do you build a rapport with people remotely, specifically with regards to pitches? Yeah, so I think you want to utilize video as much as possible, and that just doesn't. Now, you certainly you could jump on a tool like Zoom uh, is better than than a phone call or something you know like email or chat. So you definitely want to do that. But how are ways that you can really uh, build rapport even prior to that meeting? So 
Uh, could you send a, a video like with a, a tool like Bonjoro or, you know, there's a lot of different tools that you could send a, you know, a friendly video uh, when you book the call or in advance of the call um, or just that you're thinking about them and excited about the meeting. You know, how can you really warm that relationship using video in, in a really like non-salesy personalized approach, just really authentic. I think that's a, a great way that you can build uh, rapport uh, that way. Sweet. We have a question from Mary Fuller. What is a mastermind group, Chris? Oh, gr great, great question. So a mastermind group, um, there's a lot of different uh, functions that you have with a mastermind group, but you're basically getting uh, together with peers who just want to help each other out. So um, if that's a you you do social media management. Is there other uh, different agencies that uh, you could you could meet with? You know, in these times, you're probably doing it over a tool like Zoom. And uh, you just uh, check in with, uh, you know, on the, uh, like the current challenges or ideas that each person has. I recommend like a hot seat approach. So maybe you can give them, you know, 20 or 30 minutes in the hot seat where everything is, you know, everybody in the group is focused in on them and uh, they get to share kind of the context of their situation. And then everyone in the group can, can chime, on, chime in and give them some advice. So if you just rotate that around, that's a great way uh, to do it. A way that you can really up the ante is at the end of each meeting, require everyone in your group to just pick out one thing that they're going to commit to till the next time the group meets, that one action that they're going to take, and what's the evidence that they're going to bring to that group um, as evidence that they that they did it, and then uh, start the next meeting and check in on that. So that's just you can add some accountability. So it's like help and accountability. Sweet. Those can be very, very powerful. Sometimes having an accountability uh, partner can really boost your productivity. Mm -hmm. By the way, Mary, um, we do have a Facebook community uh, called Social Media Storytellers. It's not a mastermind by no means, but we do have a lot of digital agency owners and marketers and social media managers who do uh, share their wins, uh, struggles, etc. So you're more than welcome to join. We have a next question from Charles. Thank you. What is the best way you've seen an agency package for local Facebook ads for small to medium businesses? Yeah, great question. Uh, so you have to really, when you're, when you're naming your package, you got to break down what do they really want? So it's best if you, you know, if you're able to have some conversation or you've had some conversation, but um, keep asking the question of like, okay, if they say like, yeah, we want uh, more people to go to our website, ask, ask follow-up questions like, what would that do for you? And keep drilling down to the, um, the most important thing that they really need. And I would, I would put those type of terms right in your package. And as far as is price, um, I think this is a great opportunity, especially for local businesses, maybe that have been hindered with some of the stay at home uh, type of protocols is, you know, I would, I would start with uh, some either partial revenue share or a hybrid of, uh, of a, of a retainer and revenue share um, and, and really get them results. They might be a little gun shy if, if they've taken a hit. Thanks, Chris. We have a question from Mercedes. Mercedes, how can we change their mood from panic mood to buying mood? Yeah, that's a that's a really a, a great question. Um, I think you know our brains we gravitate towards clarity, and we repel complexity and confusion. So you want to you know in your communication and even what you're selling, you want to be clear because there's a, there's a lot of stress going on in uh, in their minds. So I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I think, I think you have to offer to help them before you can help them in a way. So maybe like uh, giving of your time in a, in a strategy session would be a, a really good, good way to uh, put them at ease so that the, yeah, you're just not looking for a sale. You're really looking to partner them and, and help them. I, you know, I, that might be a little individual based on on who you're talking to, but I think um, business owners and in, in, in decision makers in stress, they're not looking to add expenses. 
they're looking to invest in things that will make them money. So if you can lead with that, I think uh, you're going to have a better response. Thanks so much, Chris. I hope that answers your question. Mercedes, we have a question that's a very difficult question to answer. I hope you're ready, Chris. It's <laughs> from Mike. Uh, how to calculate your ROI with social media management? Oh, yes. Yes. I. So I, I'm not an absolute expert at this and you know, I don't, I'm not as familiar with all the tracking uh, that you can do, but any tracking that you can do is great. I wish I had the, the magic bullet uh, to that. Um, I honestly, I, I don't have that. Um, that's probably not my area expertise. There probably are people that, that would know how to, to, to show that ROI, but I'm probably not on the technical side of how, how you can really show that. Um, yeah, I probably don't have anything that would be would be a benefit there. That's all right. I can answer if you like, because that is yeah. our job. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. so yeah, Mike, that is a huge question. And it largely depends on your goals that you set out when you start social media management in the first place. Some of the key uh, sort of, um, you know, you can only measure ROI for things you track and for the goals you set. So some of the goals that traditionally businesses do set up is sort of brand awareness and just having an active presence on social media. And you would measure it by looking at the traffic to the website. Um, you, would, you could also measure uh, how your follower followers are growing. Yes, those are vanity metrics, but still, if your brand is sort of, you know, getting noticed um, by other brands in the industry, if you're getting lots of mentions, if you're getting a lot of private messages from potential customers, that's success. Of course, there's also uh, the brand awareness that you can track with traffic. So if you go into Google Analytics, if your client gives you access to Google Analytics, and if you have a social media management tool, you'll be able to figure out exactly how many uh, visits um, you're driving from different types of social media networks like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. And you can compare that month on month. Um, we've had some clients that have tripled or even quadrupled the traffic before proper social media management to, you know, to their services. So that's something that you definitely want to look at. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you do any paid advertising, uh, of course, lead generation also counts. But I think we can all agree that people come to hang out on social media. So unless you're an e your client is in e-commerce or retail where they sell products online and they're a fast purchase, it will be a little bit tougher to calculate that. But yeah, that's a super loaded question. We do yeah, have a blog. <laughs> we do have a blog though on how we can, uh, how you can create some reports. So I'll send that to you in the answer. Hope that answers it, <laughs> Mike. Um, all right, so the next one we have, uh, we have from Paul. Oh, sorry, my, the upvotes. Dad, can you still hear me? Is yes, I can now, you back. <laughs> So sorry for that. I'm not really sure what would happen. I just got kicked out. I guess the answer was too truthful. Um, <laughs> so we have a question from Gavin, Chris. You mentioned the importance of showing ROI to clients, but what are some ways we can show ROI when our clients are in an industry that's struggling right now and people are simply not buying? It, it uh, just cut out a little bit. Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Something's wrong with my internet. Uh, Gavin is asking the question, you mentioned the importance of showing ROI to clients, but what are some ways we can show ROI when our clients are in an industry that's struggling right now and people aren't buying? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, if, I mean, you, it, it probably wouldn't be fair to share, you know, previous uh, results but maybe you have to look at other other uh, other factors, maybe not just on dollars, but you know other metrics that you track, um, whether it's email opt-ins, uh, website traffic, maybe you focus on, on some of those, the variables that lead up to ROI uh, during that time. Um, maybe you can take, you know, like let's say one industry that you've worked with, I know like restaurants took a big hit. I have a, a client in that space. Um, so if you would look at a monthly picture of March, it wasn't good. But um, even if, if you're seeing upticks in the last week, those would be things worth sharing. 
Um, you just maybe have to break it down into smaller, smaller, uh, smaller chunks, but you don't want to be misleading in, in what you're, what you're leading with. But I would say if, if ROI isn't there, then you need to look at what are the other variables that you can track that could lead to ROI. It's not, you know, as ideal, um, but you know, it, it's at least something that's a, that's a great, that's a really, really tough question. That's good. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a question from Jennifer. What tools do you use to produce monthly reports for clients? Oh, that's, you know, I think when I ask my clients, so I don't, I don't actually produce the report, so I'm not like an, an expert, uh, but I actually have, I have clients that have various uh, reports. The key is, uh, you know, even with a lot of the reporting tools, um, they're very complex. And if you're, you know, you're, you're in the accounts, you know, day to day, um, they make sense to you, but I would make them as simple as possible for decision makers. So I know there's been different uh, Google Studio tools. I don't know, is, uh, is there anything on the sendable end that, that you would recommend? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So Google Analytics, I mean, everybody knows it's a, you know, a good chunk of time will take for you to learn how to use it. But yeah, so Google Analytics, if you have time, set up a Google Data Studio. And then um, as for other analytics, I would say that if you use a social media management tool that can tell you uh, very important things like, you know, shameless plug, and it will tell you what your top posts are, what your engagement is over time. It's something that you can just share with clients to show sort of ROI right away. Um, but yeah, if you don't have a social media management tool and you're doing this manually, then also, of course, any data you get from native social media networks will help you out. Yeah, Veronica, one thing I thought of is you want to, you know, especially if these, if these aren't like weekly check-ins, but they're, you know, monthly reports or quarterly reports, you want to think more about how can you tell a story in your report and really make it uh, even more human than just throwing a, a complicated dashboard at someone. So how, you know, it takes a little bit more time and in, in art to do this, but how can you take everything that's on that report or the, the key things and show it in more story form, gra you know, simple graph forms that your client will understand. Um, so I think that's an important, important piece. Yeah. That's probably the most important things I missed. Yeah, absolutely. You have to tell the story and just focus on the highlights. Like the traffic was up, you know, whatever percent based on the previous period or like some of our favorite things to recommend is to always look at the previous period. So the previous month or actually previous year. So if they haven't had proper social media management and they have tracking that goes back a year ago, and now you can say you're doing five times better and you're driving that much more traffic organically, that's quite impressive to any client. So yeah, tell a good story and focus on the highlights. Cool, uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, are you not tired, Chris? You good? No, let's go, we can, we can go all afternoon. All right. Sweet. Okay. So John Gamble is asking, would you niche your benefits packages to verticals? Just wondering about a one size fits all approach in the current environment. I think this, this bodes in this environment, but in any environment is um, we gravitate towards specialists. So if I uh, hurt my knee playing basketball, I'm going to, you know, when I'm searching for a doctor, I'm going to, I'm not going to search for a family practice uh, doctor, I'm going to look for a, a knee a sports medicine specialist. Uh, and I think that's that's the way, especially when we have the internet at our fingertips and we can find very niche uh, providers, you want to include that in, in your, uh, like your packages. So even if you have one core package, let's say it's uh, social media management, adding something like four uh, CPAs or you know, four banks, you know, you, you can, uh, you know, really slightly customize those packages for the different verticals. And, uh, and I, and I, I suggest choosing, you know, you know, a minimum of a, of a couple of verticals uh, to really go after. And you want to really, you want to inch down either by industry or on the problems that you solve. That's, that's kind of, you can do one, one of those, at least one of those. And if you can get narrow it down to both of those being really tight, that helps.
Oh, I think you're uh, muted, Veronica. All right, just give us a minute here. I think Veronica will be right back. Okay, there that was, you. hello. Sorry, I'm not quite sure. Sorry, our third party, sorry, our webinar software is playing up. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah, my internet got covered. Nice one, Ray. It really did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so sorry guys for the mishap. Uh, let me see if we have any more questions. I do feel like we do have some. Uh, just a sec. Not sorting any questions. Sorry, my whole screen is frozen. Can you see the questions, Chris? Maybe you can, yes, um, can. go through one. Yeah. yeah, this is from Kevin Taylor. So Kevin asks, any tips for hiring or partnering in order to be able to take on more clients? I would say, the first thing I would say is really be choosy about who you partner with and who you hire. You want to be choosy on the front end and quick quick to fire if, if need be. But you want to be with only with partnering with people you trust. and. Uh, you can certainly have contracts written up and agreements, but you want to have enough trust in that person or that that uh, group that you could do it on a handshake deal. So I think that's that's the the first thing uh, when hiring. You want to go with with people you trust. When hiring, I would rather hire for for culture fit and personality and uh, those you know those type of traits than skills. I always figure. You know, if I'm an agency owner, I can train train the skills, but a lot of the people skills, the 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 things that really affect your culture, uh, character, those are are things you want to look at uh, when hiring. And I'd say as as far as taking on clients, if you're not in a position where you can like shout a lot of money for salaries right away, start small and start with with contractors and build trust. And at the you know at the right time, you'll know when. Uh, when they're the right fit and you you know you financially can take that on as well perfect thanks so much chris i think i'm back so i can okay. actually see the question so i can continue so i have a question from paul about retainers so is it harder to sell a retainer versus a package in these times it may be it's not impossible you know i have clients that that do sell retainers um typically those are the ones that they have a reputation for getting an ROI. They're sharing case studies, and you know it's more of a sure bet. Um, that that can definitely work for a retainer, but you want to think about what is that life raft? You know, what's a you know like a ninety day, you know, or six you know six ninety day to six month um, that you can get in the door, build trust, get a result for them, and then you know maybe you know three to six months down the line it might be different a di different scenario. Um, you've proven uh, that you can help them. Now, if you're you're providing a service that has a lot of upfront work, that's probably not the best answer you want to hear. But you just need to get people started. And uh, if you really, you know, if, if you believe in what you do, um, you know, you should be able to upgrade them um, at, at the time. So that might be a little bit more risk on your end, especially if you have to, you know, it's a lot of upfront work to get the client onboarded and, and up and running. Nice. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we have about four more questions. Thank you, by the way, everyone who's still in the room. Really great to see 30 of you here. So thank you. Um, we have another question from Cecilia. Any recommendations on the best way to approach old contacts slash networks who you haven't spoken to in a while to ask for referral help? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, uh, first of all, I would, you know, I would set up a time to talk with them. And just you know, just to catch up, and uh, and just be relational. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't like be like, hey, can I, can I have a referral? Um, but then you want to be really clear in that in that uh, conversation. Uh, I always think of like the question that kind of naturally comes out of my mind is, well, how can I help you out when I'm talking with them in those type of meetings? And a lot of times there will be reciprocation on their end of like how they how they can help you out. So I always start with how can you be helpful, um, especially if you haven't talked in a while. 
Um, but th these are actually, I think during these times, people, a lot of them are at home and they maybe have some extra time on their hands. This is a great time to reach out to them. And maybe it's, you're not going to even ask on the first time that you talk to them. Maybe you need to build some rapport or uh, help them out in some way. Or if you now have a more specific niche or a specific promise that you have for your packages, it's a great time to maybe share that uh, with them. That's really perfect. Just be helpful. Mm -hmm. That's as simple as it gets. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Michael. Um, what kind of outreaching and business development do you recommend to establish connections in a time we cannot physically go store to store? And then another question, how do you make people feel comfortable spending money in a time when people are so uncertain of what will happen? Okay, yeah, there's, there's several things here. If you're used to prospecting store to store, um, one of the things I'd actually recommend, and this is, this is maybe a little legwork up front, is um, if you've ever uh, heard of Marcus Sheridan, um, he's a, a pretty well-known speaker in, in the in the marketing and business space. Uh, he has a great book called They Ask You Answer. And it's really taking those common questions that maybe you receive your salespeople receive or the people who are doing account management or even uh, are fielding customer service questions um, or common, even common questions that come up in the sales process, turn that into content. Because right now, you know, when you're doing outreach, um, it, it might have to be via email or a messenger and you know what's the you know when we when we are considering meeting with someone chances are they're going to check you out online so um you can update websites you can update uh it could be linkedin profiles uh and you want to create content that would address you know some things that they're already they're already uh thinking about so that's a way that you can kind of prep on the front end so that a lot of times if they've gone through your content and they take the meeting, they're already, you've already started to build trust with them and uh, you're more of the go-to person. As far as establishing connections, um, I would use you know video if you can, like hey, I shot a, a quick video. Um, if you happen to know their business or their business model or what they need, uh, you could offer some tips for them, uh, personalized tips. Um, if you have a, you know, a case study post uh, or like, hey, you know, I've been working a lot with your type of, you know, let's say it's a store that sells cell phones. So I've been working with a lot of cell phone brands and been getting great results. I've seen a, you know, a return of 2X on their investment. Would you like to talk more about that? Um, and I would utilize again, video, you know, you know, use uh, video conferencing versus phone if you can. And obviously phone is better than just text or email. As far as how to make people feel comfortable spending money in a time when it's so uncertain, yeah, they're ready to, I, I'd probably have beat the dead horse on this, but um, they're looking to put a quarter in and get two quarters out. So you need to be, you need to have a system that can get people an ROI. More than ever, I guess. You always <laughs> needed it, but now it's yeah. very, very needed. Perfect. All right, three more questions and we're ready to go. So one from John, would you niche your benefits packages to verticals? Oh, I think oh, we, we answered this one. one. Just, yeah. yeah, we got that one. Sorry, John, we already answered it. Um, Eric Goldstein is asking any tools besides Sendable that you're using for omni-channel marketing? So I guess tracking your traffic or anything you've heard your clients use that's helpful for them? I haven't, I haven't. I probably uh, don't dive into those types of, uh, like technical questions with them, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm more on their, you know, their business and, and growth end. So I probably wouldn't be the best person to ask. Cool. We conveniently, um, well, not conveniently, um, there are a bunch of marketing automation tools. I think what you mentioned, Chris, is that you have to pick the tools that you know, if there are tools that you know, um, and really capitalize on them. There are a bunch of, um, you know, if you know Shopify, for example, you can work more with um, e-commerce websites. Um, we at Sendable, we use HubSpot for all the omni-channel marketing mm -hmm. and we found it quite mm -hmm. useful. So, yeah. and they, by the way, they have lots of great educational resources so you can check it out. Mm -hmm. All right, F final question from Mercedes. So how many times should you follow up if they sounded interested, but they are now, sh they shadowed or ghosted you? <laughs> oh, this is, a, this is a great question. I'm not a master like salesperson, but these are just things that I've noticed as people have approached me. 
And uh, first of all, you don't want to just like do the same thing over and over again. I know that that feels like like spam. So um, I would say, you know, if you reach out, let's say you're reaching out via email, I would go maybe could you do the Bonjoro route where you maybe have a, a, a video or like an audio. I, I forget the tools that you can use to send little little sound bites. I think that could make it it, it personal. And then uh, if you're able to connect with them on on social in a different way, um, whether it's video or sound or, or text, um, I would I would try you know like some of the the uh, like your case studies. Um, if you're doing if you're doing any online training or like a Facebook Live, I would invite. Sometimes it's easier to invite people um, because when they when you're setting up a meeting, sometimes they they automatically think sales call and they automatically think I'm going to be cornered in a room until I have to buy something. That's just like, that might not be your approach, but that's what they might be thinking. So what could you invite them to that, um, you know, they could learn more about what you do. You can prove your your uh, your skills and, and your thought leadership. Um, yeah, that's, that's what comes to mind as far as what, what's something different that, or or can you make a connection to them in another way that could help them? So switch that's it actually up. a really, yeah, that's really a clever idea to just do a Facebook Live or a free online session and just invite them. It's actually really great because I think we've done this session with uh, Devin um, a few weeks ago, and what you know what she mentioned is that you know as an agency, your clients, existing clients, they really want to know how you stand in this and how you're you know you yourself you're a thought leader, so they will look to you and what you think it would work or would not work based on what you have. Oh, yeah, clients. I actually have one more thing, um, especially during these times. I actually did this with with uh, my clients and then people in my network. And then I had some clients do that with, with their businesses. But they just said a send a, a message or an email of like, you know, how can I help? You know, like they, they offered to I offered to sit down with people for a free 30 minute session. And uh, just whether it's they need encouragement or they need help with with any particular thing. Uh, just offering that you're there. And uh, even people that didn't take me up on that actually were really appreciative. So like no sales pitch, just like, how can I help? Perfect. I think that that's a great place to end. I think we've gone through all of the questions. Once again, thank you so much for so many questions. I hope we answered them to your uh, satisfaction. And of course, I'm share, we're going to share uh, Chris's email and contact details and also the recording for this. So you'll have everything in the email um, after the session. Chris, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, no, thank you so much for having me and uh, love the questions and the interaction and the fact that you're willing to, uh, you, those of you online were, were willing to ask those really difficult questions. I, I appreciate that. It means that you're really digging in and you're taking uh, your agency seriously. Sweet. We're all in this together at the end of the day. Yes, we are. All right. Well, thank you again so much. Have a beautiful afternoon, day or evening, wherever you are. And we hope to see you soon somewhere online. All right. Bye. Bye.